discussing the title with the panelists, we noted that it has a lot to discuss. And so to narrow down the conversation just a bit, we decided it was most appropriate, given the forum, to specifically focus on the implications and opportunities for Canada. So here's kind of the question that we're going to address, is how does Canada ensure that it's both well-prepared and well-positioned? <clears throat> it still gives us a lot to cover in 45 minutes, but we'll give us it our, our best shot. The format is we're going, I'm going to pitch a question to each individual panelist and then let the remainder of the, of the panelists address uh, the answer that was given and add on, um, and then we'll move on to the next question. I have four questions, and then after that, I'm hoping we'll have time to go to the floor. So first, I'm going to ask Amy to address. In the past year, we've seen both the removal of term limits for President Xi and the signals of increased military confidence in the South and East China Seas. In addition, we see the global power balance shifting, and with the waning of American influence and the waxing of Chinese, where does Canada fit in? What are the implications for Canada of a more assertive China? And we'll start with Amy. Love the question. Um, I, I especially uh, like the fact that we're bringing up the power shift term. And that's really the crux of the problem. Uh, we're very stressed about the trade wars and what's going to happen and the world's coming to the end. But really, the trade wars are only a symptom of this bigger problem, which is the power shift. And in terms of how does Canada fit in, we need to figure out, well, what is our play in this power shift? If we just step back a little bit um, in terms of history and, and where we're coming from and the, and the position of luxury that we've been in, right? The G7, we were listening to the G7 talks just earlier. The G7 dictated or, or determined how the world economic order was going to operate. And uh, we got very comfortable in that. And because this group built that momentum, uh, they knew the rules of the game. Uh, but we did such a good job at building the world economy that there's a G20 now. There's new players at the table. And these new players, of course, uh, bring to the table a, a new set of rules or a new game book, if you will. So in terms of what do we need to do, we need to actually adjust and shift and say, it's not just our rule book anymore. How do these um, other players like China, right, that are part of the G20, et cetera, how do they do business? And these are emerging entrants, right? They have a different philosophy. They have different needs. They have different comfort levels. So that's, that's I just wanted to level set on that, that bit. So the, the power shift. So because of the power shift, uh, there's a new world order. Uh, President Xi is not going away anywhere <laughs> any, anytime soon. And <clears throat> he's publicly declared that he loves the way he operates. And he's going to actually coach other emerging countries on the China model, how to you know, grow and succeed and thrive in this new global economy. So we need to get smarter. We need to understand what, what these new dynamics are, what this new philosophy is, and adapt and change. Easier said than done. So, what are some of the, the elements? I think the other part of your question was the implications for Canada of a more assertive China. We've got it really good and we're really comfortable. We need to start getting uncomfortable. We need to shake ourselves up a bit and uh, we need to take a look at what's happening in the USA. It's not because they're bad people necessarily. Uh, it's, it's because they, they've been at it longer than we have. So we do have the opportunity to, to learn uh, from, from this experience and figure out how do we want to show up. So some, some ways, uh, our innovation advantage is, is also going to be, um, well, it already is uh, on the table. Uh, we've been known to be innovative. We've had the technological advancements that, you know, we've set the, uh, the stage in a lot of areas. Uh, but they are ramping up very quickly. So how are we going to learn how to become better instead of just being complacent at being the best in certain things? How are we going to learn about new innovation models? The other is foreign direct investment. Yep. Big, big implications, and I think we're going to talk about that more later. But what is our policy? What are the parameters? How are we going to let them in? Um, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to say ACON, <laughs> right? I don't, I don't want to bring it up. but. 
it's a big deal. Well, it's a big deal because we're not prepared for it, really. Acon had been looking for, for uh, investment capital for over a year. Canada couldn't give it any. China said, hey, we'll help you out. Now we're all panicky. I'm not saying we shouldn't be, but what are the parameters? Are we going to be more comfortable just saying, okay, all foreign direct investments, 49%, capping at 49%, you can't buy us out. Um, and then, and then the, the other element, and I know I uh, <laughs> need to speed it up. Um, the other element is just getting our business people prepared. Because we've been, uh, we live in a, in a really great country, uh, um, it, the economy's been pretty good, we're very comfortable, we need to get prepped. We need to understand how the Chinese do business, that parlays into other emerging uh, nations as well in terms of uh, psychology and, and, and um, philosophy of doing things. And then we need to help them out, right? Help propel the economy a little bit more. So I think that's good because it, what I'm really taking away is the reassessing the rule book piece of it, which it, I think falls very nicely into the broader G7 context and also preparing um, industry and business. So before we move on to the next question, I just want to give the, the remainder of the panelists a, a chance to chime in. Um, can, can, I ask, uh, can I ask you? Sure. Uh, um, well, uh, not to take too long, but I would say uh, in terms of uh, a more assertive China um, in a military sense, yep. in terms of the rule book, uh, one of the real risks is uh, an elevated uh, risk of miscalculation. And I think um, so as military forces are going to be um, uh, in each other's company more often and perhaps uh, even more uh, confrontationally in some circumstances, um, some sort of um, an agreement on preventing incidents at sea, I think, is, is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And uh, other measures either track to or direct to get a better understanding of one another just to reduce the risk of miscalculation, inadvertent miscalculation, I think would be a good investment. Absolutely. And I'll turn it over to my left side over here. Deanna, do you have some thoughts on... Well, since it was brought up, um, I think the, the issue on, in, on investment is an important one. But I think we should look at it in terms of reciprocity. After all, there are a lot, there's a lot of Chinese investment going globally. China is a huge player in a number of fields. And I think as long as we are concerned to the extent that we don't give them more than they are willing to give us, I think that is something that that uh, that we should be looking at uh, in those, and I'll leave the rest for later when we talk about it. But Important. go ahead. <laughs> Great, Rob. Well, they are more assertive. There's no question about that. There's been political change in China. We should. My only comment at this point would be: we should accept that. We should acknowledge it, and we should design policies and approaches that reflect that fact. And my own experience has been: the more we're engaged with China through trade, through political contacts through developing strategies, not just for the next year, but for the next five and 10 years, the better we'll be to influence the direction that China takes. So are we well positioned now? I think we're pretty well positioned. I, I really do, and I'll come to that when okay, I address excellent. my uh, question. All right, I'm, I'm, they, they were all assigned questions, and they're being very good about sticking to the assigned <laughs> questions. So my next question, um, with the strategic work being done in China, with Belt and Road, as well as Made in China 2025, how does Canada ensure that its national interests are met while taking advantage of the opportunities Chinese FDI um, presents? So, and, and on this, is, this question is for Deanna, as she alluded to earlier. So also, is the involvement of state-owned enterprises and the co-opting of intellectual property something we need to have a more rigorous debate on within Canada, or are the current processes sufficient? Well, I'm going to actually go back to what Ailish was talking about because that kind of jives with some of the work that I'm doing. So I'm looking at China as a global tech marketplace. And I look at it from the perspective of where are Canadian companies actually locating in China? So it's not only exporting, it's where they are. And the whole point of this is when, when the data that we have, and I, there is a map that you can look at, it's called uh, CanAsia Footprint, it's on the Monk School site, but I then take a deeper dive and look at the companies who are actually there. 
What this tells us is that for specifically for tech companies, China is really important. And in fact, you could say that the future of Canadian technology and our expertise in technology, our ability to get into the global marketplace is very dependent on China. China is a huge partner for Canada and that's something when you're thinking about the future and what I'm doing is looking at where the companies are. Why are they there? It's not necessarily about the Chinese marketplace. And in fact, some of the interviews that we've done show that a lot of them are not particularly interested in the China market. They're interested in the global market and they're interested in what China has to offer them from being able to rapidly have a prototype made in Shenzhen, for example. So I think that's something that we, uh, that we need to uh, keep in mind. So when we, the data that we have, the largest number of Canadian companies in China in the tech sector are in, ad, are in advanced manufacturing. And a lot of that is automotive related. So it's including some of the bigger companies in that sector. So that's number one. But number two, and most of those are, about half of them, I guess, are large companies. Number two, though, is a sector called, we call services and analytics. These are SMEs. These are SMEs locating in China because this is where the opportunities are. So I think that that's something that we have to think about. Um, Belt and Road, I think, has an opportunity for Canada, but let's not think about it in terms of China. Let's think about it in terms of where these, where the opportunities are in the countries. I don't think that we have opportunity unless we have something to offer in those third countries, but it's something that we should definitely uh, be pursuing. Um, SOEs, uh, there's no doubt that China's glo growing in global reach. That's what we're talking about. Some of the SOEs are, are publicly traded. So one expects that they, to a certain extent, have a commercial interest and are active commercially, um, are successful commercially. Why not partner with them? But as I said earlier, we have to make sure that the opportunities are operate in, in, in both uh, sections. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I think I'll leave it there. Uh, oh, a tech transfer. The, the real challenge is the forced tech transfer in China. Now, the companies that are in China in the tech sector, and that's what I'm following, um, they are often evolving so quickly that the IP issue is not as great because they're already ahead of the people who are following them. It is an issue though, but for forced tech transfer in particular, that's something we need to pursue. And that's something where other countries have the same issue yeah. and we should be uh, lining up with them. So before we move on, I just want to push on one item that you, yeah. that you discussed. And, and I think it's very true. So businesses are moving to China because of what China has to offer. And a lot of times that's a level of insight and a level of access to information and data that is being culled off of the population. Um, it's other you know, advantages that they might not have in a more controlled kind of democratic society such as Canada. So I'm kind of wondering how much of this is something that we're profiting off of uh, a different set of, of rules of the game when you're locating in, in China versus Canada. Well, to the, to the extent that services and analytics, that's like probably one of the reasons why there are more companies in that sector. I cannot say, though, that this is uh, solely what they're doing and actually that they are also looking at uh, Chinese data specifically. I don't have that information, so I don't want to comment on that specifically. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to turn quickly to Amy and then back to Rob and then over to Bruce to comment on that question. Yeah, what aspects? So, so I um, keep it short because yes. I've got... Keep it short, maybe um, tech transfer and, and how, because you were working with American companies and how they address kind of some of the challenges on tech transfer. Yeah, so that's a big issue, uh, obviously. Uh, so I worked for Cisco for over 10 years and, and that's how I got wise, wiser on China is because I was uh, trying to help our global sales teams manage the competitive challenge of Huawei. So... Uh, that's, yeah. uh, they have a different set of ethics and principles when it comes to tech transfer, and that's the delicate balance. And that's where I think we can really benefit from uh, partnering or allying with uh, our USA partners as they deal with this uh, in a more assertive manner. Um, <clears throat> 
It's tricky. <laughs> it's tricky. I talk to clients and they, they want to go and they want to go to China and they want to do, do work with China, but they're worried about, because knowledge transfer, and it's not just a China issue. I, th I think it's, it's any emerging nation. They want to learn. And the, the challenge is they're better at commercializing. They're better at, they're more assertive, as you said, right? So our fear really is what are they going to do with it and are they going to do something with it faster than, than us? And, and yes, yeah. do I use them as a conduit? It's, it's probably not going to be just a, a conduit. It's not a channel. No. All right. Rob? No, not much to add, only that uh, there are enormous opportunities for us if we get this right, but that's a big if. Right. Um, and it's a subject that will no doubt be part of the discussions between the United States and China, and I hope between Canada and China over the coming months as the U.S. addresses this uh, major trade risk they have as they see it with China. So I think it's something that we're, we should be talking very closely to the Americans on and perhaps sharing information on their approach to this issue. Well, I think as more and more of our economy becomes I mean, based on intellectual property and based on ideas and services as opposed to goods, it becomes a greater and greater Absolutely. issue. Bruce, do you have anything to add on? Uh, well, I guess the transfer of uh, military intellectual property uh, is um, uh, not necessarily follows uh, normal channels, <laughs> uh, but uh, it does have the potential to undermine an awful lot of other uh, business that we do with China. Sure, and, and uh, yeah, it goes back to the, this whole idea of, of a different rule book. So, um, and this next question is to Rob. The United States, Canada's closest trading partner, has decided to lean in on an aggressive trade strategy that, it's, that is at its core all about corralling China. So Canada could easily become collateral damage, especially as Canada looks to engage with free trade talks with the Chinese. How does Canada balance the demands of the two largest markets as well as those of its domestic narrative? Okay, thanks, Sarah. Small it, question. It's a big, big <laughs> question. And it's been, it's been touched on already in a number of presentations today, but let me put some thoughts on the table and then I'd be happy to talk about them further. We all know U.S. is our largest trading partner. Alish mentioned 70%. I actually think it's more than that in terms of two-way trade. China, a second biggest trading partner in terms of two-way trade. You add those two together and you're looking at something greater than 82, 83% of our two-way trade and something also representing 40% of G, uh, global GDP and growing. So we better get this balance right. I guess that's the conclusion I reach. Uh, we know the U.S. is pursuing an aggressive and very public rebalancing process with China. They're looking for a reduction of the merchandise trade deficit. Uh, the President of the United States seems particularly focused on these large numbers of trade imbalances. Um, there, uh, various statistics are on the table, but a lot of people are talking in terms of $340 billion merchandise trade surplus between uh, that China has with the U.S. The U.S. is looking for a reduction of that, depending on the day of the week, of 100 or 200 <laughs> billion dollars. So these are big numbers. They're looking for greater assurances from the Chinese on intellectual property, improved access to the Chinese market for U.S. goods, including automotive products. They're looking for improved investment opportunities in China. And of course, they're talking about cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. So it's a very long agenda, and this is not going to be a short or easy discussion. Um, but we do run a real risk, as implied in your question, that we might be sideswept. Um, and we've already seen a little bit of this in, uh, in actions the U.S. has taken on steel and aluminum. So what should we do? Well, I have a few a few thoughts on that. First, I think our first priority should be securing our position in NAFTA. That makes sense to me as uh, a long-term trade officer in the department. Um, we should do what we can, and I think we are doing what we can to try to ensure that NAFTA remains in place and that our privileged position within North America is secured. However, the agreement is adjusted, and I think our negotiators, including the Minister of Foreign Affairs, is doing a very good job. Um, secondly, the U.S. will be looking for assurances from us in the context of those discussions that we will not undercut their efforts with China. Uh, Ron Ambrose mentioned that this morning, and I think that's absolutely right. We should assume that's the case, and in fact, they've been relatively public in this. <laughs> uh, I think we should be working with both sides, both the Chinese and the Americans, to try to resolve this problem. I really would like to see us try to tone down the hyperbole, uh, particularly coming from the U.S. side of a trade war. The Chinese don't want this, and I really don't believe that the U.S. wants this either. 
uh, but it's out there, people are jumping on it, and I think it's, uh, I think Canada can, can help in trying to tone that rhetoric down a little bit. Would, would you suggest almost an interlocutor role, or? No, not an interlocutor role, but I think we can be talking to both sides okay. as these discussions between them evolve and exploring the kinds of solutions that might make more sense than just uh, unilateral trade actions leading to counteractions. I personally think we should be supporting the U.S. agenda for some rebalancing of the relationship. The Chinese joined the WTO in 2001. They signed a contract. We agreed to that contract. But it's 17 or 18 years old, and the world has changed very dramatically since that time. Uh, China has gone through an incredible period of growth and shows no sound a, a sign of significantly slowing down. But I think we should be encouraging the U.S., privately and publicly, if they are going to take actions on these issues, they should do so within the global trading system, within WTO rules. I'm worried yeah. that, that uh, the U.S. administration's target, in addition to many of these bilateral agreements, is actually the structure of the world trading framework itself. We, can, we have worked with the Americans in those institutions for over 60 years. I think we can play a role in discussing with them in private. Um, how those rules might be adjusted or how they might play within the rules and still achieve some of their objectives in what we could call the rebalancing of the relationship. Um, in the medium term, and I would say after we've secured, I'm being an optimist, an optimist here, secured our position in North America with NAFTA, I think we should proceed to open free trade agreement uh, negotiations <coughs> with the Chinese. I think that serves Canada's interest and we shouldn't be afraid of pursuing it. Um, by the same token, I think we should do what we can to try to uh, facilitate the U.S. to re-enter the TPP. I think it was a mistake and I think many in the U.S. Administra US administration would even recognize that it was a Absolutely. mistake yeah, I think for them to around. withdraw as quickly as they did. And I think we can play a real role in making things a little bit easier for them. The, in the short term, there's some advantages to Canada, or there will be some advantages to Canada to being in the TPP when the U.S. is not. But I think we can, I think in the medium and longer term, it serves our interest to have the U.S. constructively engaged in the Pacific region. Um, I think that... Uh, when we talk to the Chinese about uh, the possibility of opening discussions on a free trade agreement, we should recognize the fact, and this came out of the, very evidently out of the, the Prime Minister's trip to China in December of last year, that we cannot use and should not use, in my view, negotiation of a free trade agreement or the uh, launch of discussions on a free trade agreement to promote social change within China. Ch China will change at its own pace. China will change because it wants to change, not because uh, we have launched free trade negotiations with them or the exploration of free trade discussions with them. So yes, we should project our values yeah. through those negotiations, but no, I don't think we should have as a prerequisite to the opening of discussions a list of social and other uh, objectives that we have that the Chinese at this stage at least would find impossible to meet. Is there an opportunity there for a similar process as to what Canada did with CETA where you had the parallel political values piece and the trade piece perhaps with one going a bit at a bit different pace than so. the other? I think and the, the Chinese are very pragmatic. They never have run away from the prospect of discussing environmental issues, the role of women. In fact, right. women are playing an increasingly important part in the Chinese economy. Um, and uh, human rights, uh, other issues. They, they're happy to talk about those things. They just don't want to have a prerequisite for the discussion of a free trade yeah. agreement that those will be a fundamental part of, uh, of an agreement. Deanna, do you have anything to add? Well, Rob used to be my boss, so I, <laughs> I agree with everything he said. Um, just a couple of things to, uh, to add. First of all, I think it's very important with the China relationship that we adopt the same kind of advocacy strategy in the U.S. that we have for NAFTA. Because so much of what we do with China ha involves different types of value chains. Secondly, we need to get off this bilateral trade deficit thing. It's so, it is, it really <laughs> is a red herring. It doesn't really tell the whole story. First of all, when you think about what you buy the, from Sony or Panasonic, it's all made in China, it, but it's not a Japanese export. Therefore, you know, and this is happening all over the place. So that's something that I think we need 
uh, we need to recognize. Um, and I think that um, we need to focus on uh, where we have the opportunities, services. We don't necessarily even, uh, we wouldn't need to call it a trade agreement. I think we should get away from the word trade. This is commerce. <laughs> a lot of the companies who we're looking at in China are not considered quote unquote exporters. So they are there to be in the global commerce, in global commerce, and China is a critical part of that. So it almost sounds like you're saying there's a complete shift in the paradigm of how we think about global trade and commerce. Absolutely. Hmm. Amy. Uh, yeah, I, I agreed with almost all of Rob's <laughs> points. Um, but the one that I wanted to focus in on, and very succinctly, is the, uh, the idea of Canada taking the lead that we have the opportunity now to not necessarily be the, the peacemaker, but had, what, is, what is China the West 2.0 or 3.0? And I call that, uh, that word, that magical solution, coopetition. Can we figure out how, do we, how can we cooperate and be competitive at the same time? Because I think that's ultimately <laughs> what's going on. Do you like that, Bruce? I'm going to smile. You said co <laughs> But I do like that. Derivations. I do like that. Derivations. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I think, I think that's really, it, that really is Canada's role is yeah. saying, yes, we want to play. We don't want to make an enemy on either side. And here's how we can all get along and play in the same sandbox. Well, and it strikes me, too, that it aligns with what the deputy minister said earlier today when he talked about the three points of, of how he moved forward on the foreign policy agenda, that it speaks to both to all three, trade, multilateralism, as well as presence. And so it kind of seems to, to fit in all three baskets. Mm -hmm. Bruce? I'll leave it. You'll leave this one? Yeah. All right, well, the next one's yours. So, um, you know, in having, in having your expertise available to us on this panel, I wanted to, to look at the Arctic for a moment and talk about how the Chinese are already well ahead of the pack in determining how best to use the Northern Sea routes. They've asked for full status in the Arctic Council. Um, currently, they're observers and they're preparing to invest in infrastructure and resource extraction projects in the Arctic. How concerned should Canada be? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I'd say uh, that um, there's room for concern, but certainly not for panic. Uh, and I would also say that the area of concern is not necessarily focused on what China is doing or would like to do, but more what Canada is not. Um, the Chinese put a policy statement out earlier this year. I think many people will have seen it. I think it was really aimed at an external audience to assuage concerns that they had uh, some sort of a nefarious purpose in the North. Um, but uh, if, you, if you look at it, it really takes pains to use all of the right language. They talk about uh, coastal state rights. They talk about development talk about the United Nations Conference on Law of the Sea, or Convention on Law of the Sea and, uh, and International Law. They talk about the importance of the environment and the importance of supporting indigenous peoples and uh, communities. And, and I take that as a, as a positive sign. Um, having said that, it, it really does um, come back to how all of this is interpreted, particularly how the law is interpreted. And I think some of the coastal states and, and others in the South China Sea have a view that China perhaps has a different interpretation in some, um, some of the measure, uh, portions of these statutes than, than they do. So uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to see. But it does signal a desire to invest, um, particularly in scientific and uh, development or resource exploration. Um, and, and I think that that's, uh, that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Um, they also uh, signal a real desire to uh, invest in infrastructure to support industry. <coughs> so uh, extraction industry, ports, airfields, and so on. Um, again, that, that could be a good thing or it could be a challenge. So what are some of the risks to Canada in this? And it's a much bigger conversation with the Arctic Council and opportunities, but I'll focus on some of the risks to Canada. Um, one of the risks is... Um, that China develops either better or different data than Canada uh, in Canada's regulatory spaces and, um, and, and adjacent spaces. And uh, dealing with fish, dealing with minerals, dealing with oil and gas, uh, and reconciling the potential for disagreement and conflict related to 
uh, Canada's view of responsibilities for regulation and China's view of a very open, cooperative approach to all of this where, in fact, the data that they have uh, is the important data will have to be something that we'll be watching. I think um, another risk is that China does a better job of laying infrastructure in the north than the government of Canada. Uh, and we have seen this in other, uh, in other parts of the world where Chinese, uh, China is uh, enthusiastic to become a development partner and countries are enthusiastic, at least initially, to welcome that development assistance. Uh, and I think um, that, that poses a, uh, a, a policy challenge for the government and a regulatory challenge for the government that uh, if we wait until it starts happening, uh, we're about five or ten years too late to address it. Um, another risk, I think, is that, that uh, China has a greater presence than the government of Canada uh, in the north, particularly in uh, coastal areas of the north, in terms of numbers of vessels, representatives on the ground, managing with industry and liaising with government. And I think uh, that uh, is not of immediate concern, but there are some second and third order consequences of that that need to be carefully considered when we look at how, that we'll, uh, how we'll adjust to that. Um, finally, I would say um, that China um, could position um, resources in the north so as to be able to respond better than the government of Canada to search and rescue incidents, to environmental disasters or issues, uh, and, uh, and other problems where Canadians would expect the government of Canada to be the first responders. And uh, so that it, it, um, it may pose challenges in terms of resource allocation and prioritization that, um, that are not insurmountable, but they will force a different approach. Or perhaps opportunities for partnership. Well, so, so this is my point. Um, I think there are real opportunities that come out of this. I think opportunities uh, to partner in development where the expense of doing so hitherto for the government of Canada has been prohibitive. Mm -hmm. We've, there's been lots of talk, uh, but some of the development um, has been slow in the north. Um, so regardless of uh, whether these are opportunities or challenges, I, I think it's going to require a shift from rhetoric to real action on the part of the government of Canada in uh, terms of northern development and capability, uh, particularly in terms of um, surveillance and monitoring, in terms of communications capability, uh, and in terms of the ability to establish presence and to um, derive and enforce regulations that are the right of the government of Canada to establish. Um, there, there are a couple of other considerations. And the first is that it might uh, result in a challenge to our assertion of internal waters uh, within the Arctic archipelago, archipelago, which I think has been a sleeping dog. Right. Uh, but I think this has potential to, to poke that sleeping dog. <laughs> uh, and the other interesting emerging challenge may well be our, um, our claim of our continental shelf in the Arctic, where, whereas before we had kind of a more or less um, uh, personal domain within which we were working, right. uh, and we may find that there are other national interests now that creep in and, uh, and challenge uh, our assertions in, in respect to how far the continental shelf extends from Canada uh, and what rights and obligations come with that for Canada. Uh, and it strikes me as you're, sp as you're going through all these challenges that it's almost the flip, and maybe I'll, I'll ask um, and Rob and Deanna to take a, 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 a swing at this, that it's almost the flip of the relationship that we have with the United States and that you have another superpower, and rather than have kind of the completely interconnected security relationship that you have with the other one, um, you, you, know, you have kind of a, a different space that you're operating in, and yet you're also trying to align, you know, a, issues on political and on trade, on economic issues, and how, how, what are the chances that Canada can pull all of these different issues together into a coherent package and, 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 ma and take advantage of the, of the appropriate positioning and be prepared for the worst case scenario? What are the chances of Canada <laughs> pulling all these pieces together for a coherent package? I, I don't know. But I, do, <laughs> <laughs> but I do think we should be trying. Um, China's going to do this anyway. China has an interest in the Arctic. They have an interest in transportation through the Arctic. 
They're making major investments. They've flagged this publicly. Yeah. They've asked to consult with us on these issues. I think we should. Uh, I think we should be. The opportunity is there to partner. Absolutely, and I, I think, without wanting to get into it I, in any detail, I think there are some linkages between what China is interested in doing and Canada's interests in the Arctic and their rights and our rights of international passage and issues related to uh, to increasing tensions in the South China Sea. Yeah. Oh, I didn't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would just say, just in addition to that, you know, this is another example where China deserves to be a part of the Arctic. There should not be this, the kind of reaction of, oh my God, what, are they, what do they want? Um, I think that this is all part of their role in global commerce. I think we should be pursuing it, but keeping our interests in mind and seeing where we're aligned, because I think as Rob and others have said, there is a lot of opportunity there. So now I'll turn to the floor. Are there questions from the floor for our panel? Do you have any? If not, I, I'd like to just push a little bit farther on that last question um, with Bruce because I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, you know, as you're looking towards the, you know, the Canadian strong, secure, and engaged and, and their platform looking at the Arctic, are you finding that they are positioning themselves in a situation that they'll be prepared to deal with the potential challenges of an opening Arctic and, and China's role in that? Well, first of all, I'd say uh, that uh, the, the risk or the threat, if you like, that's posed by this is not a military one. Uh, I think there's, uh, there's no uh, reason to believe that, uh, that there will be a, um, uh, at least in the, uh, in the next 10 years, a Chinese military presence in the North that would threaten Canada. Um, but uh, there is every reason to believe that if the Chinese have significant investments in the North that become threatened by something, that they will defend them. Right. Um, so I, I say that uh, the, the real investment in strong, secure, and engage in the North um, has to do with our ability to understand and operate within our own sovereign spaces. Um, and our, uh, you know, what are, what are the key elements of that? Um, well, the first is awareness. Uh, the next is uh, the ability to coordinate um, uh, forces and, uh, and work with the rest of the government to establish um, presence and to exercise sovereignty and to enforce regulation. Uh, and the third is to be able to move in this huge and inhospitable domain, even though um, the climate is changing, I believe that will make it less uh, conducive to travel um, in many respects, uh, in terms of uh, changing weather and in terms of changing terrain, uh, it may become more challenging to get around quickly than, uh, especially on the ground, uh, than it is now. So our ability to understand that and to be able to work within those conditions is key. And I think that's, that's the principal focus of Strong, Secure, Engage, is let's make sure that, that we know how to secure our own spaces. Uh, I don't think that there is an underpinning of uh, a military threat to the North per se, at least not a territorial one or one that is uh, directly in the war. Uh, you're right, war. it's data-driven. It's, 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 it's surveillance and data-driven, yeah. which goes back to your point, is it's like this is the, the, the new horizon, I think, for, mm -hmm. for all of it. Um, any last words from any of us? Are you going to ask us about books? Oh, that's right. Colin, I almost forgot. Rob, I'll start with you. Oh, what are you reading? I wrote down the author. Hold on. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> I'm reading a book. I'm interested in natural history, mm -hmm. and I'm interested. I'm reading a book called *Sapiens*, *Sapiens*, by Noah Hariri. It's really an interesting book. It's if you're at all interested in the evolution of humankind. Not a bad thing to be reading about <laughs> these right. days. I think it puts us in our place uh, with the with the rest of the world. Excellent. Um, you. I'm reading uh, The Power of Ideas by Cheng Li. Um, he's head of the Thornton Center at uh, Brookings, and he will be speaking at Monk. I'll be introducing him on June the 11th. If anybody is going to be in Toronto on that day, you're all welcome. Excellent. Amy? I'm going to say The Bible. That's my uh, big book by the, by the bed, and it's uh, chock full of drama, mm. leadership <laughs> guidance, personal <laughs> tips, and a glimpse into the future. <laughs> All there. Bruce? That's a hard act to follow, yeah. Amy. 
Well, uh, I just finished reading Ravi Robertson's testimony, which is, uh, was fascinating. Um, uh, but uh, I've just started Dave Fraser's book on Op Medusa. Yeah. Many people, I think, are starting that this, <laughs> this week. Excellent. Thank you all. I see Colin's ready. Sarah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my job is, of course, to try and keep us on time. And thank you so much for this panel. <laughs>